expecting your presentation. Thank Much, you. Muchas gracias. Buenas tardes. Me llamo Chris. Soy de Londres, Inglaterra. Lo siento, no hablo español. <laughs> so you have another British accent talking to you for another hour. But I will not be the chief unhappiness officer. I want, I want to leave you with a positive view. I'm very optimistic about digitalization and the internet. I heard the concerns expressed by some, the challenges that you've been hearing through this morning. And it is challenging because it changes everything we do. But equally, it includes everyone on Earth. And this is a critical point in the new book that's released this year, Digital Human, is that this digital revolution includes everyone on planet Earth. And therefore, it releases a huge amount of opportunity for everyone on planet Earth, because everybody can trade, transact, connect, network, and talk through this global revolution. It means that all the people who have been historically unbanked, half of Latin Americans, adults, are unbanked, can now get banked. But it's not banking as we knew it. It's a new form of banking. And equally, I just heard a comment around last year's conference here, and I know who your keynote speaker was, and he says that we need banking, but we don't need banks. That is stupid. <laughs> because how can you do banking without a bank? That's what a bank is for. But it's a different form of bank. It's a digital bank. It's a bank that is only just coming into fruition and only just being released. And the reason why we're demanding digital banks is that everybody's got digital access and is uploading and downloading huge amounts of stuff. 20 years ago, I worked with a company called Teradata, which would mine and analyze terabytes of data and cost millions of dollars to implement. Today, we upload 60 terabytes of data every second. Wow. Because we have unlimited bandwidth, unlimited networking, unlimited capabilities. And that's the reason why the tech companies have become the giants they are today. The most capitalized, valued companies in the world, the trillion dollar company now appears. It's also interesting, as you'll hear through my presentation, that often we look the wrong way for the future. I look for the future here, across Chile and Colombia and Brazil and Argentina and China and India and Philippines and Indonesia, because that's where the innovation is happening across Nigeria, Uganda, Tanzania, Zimbabwe. It isn't happening in America. So don't always look to America for innovation, and particularly in financial innovation, it's not happening from the US. But they are doing some interesting things, and they do have highly valued companies. And what they're showing us is that the revolution that's taking place is companies that can now connect people are the most valuable companies. They're connecting people who have something with people who need something. They're connecting people who want to share their lives with their friends. They're connecting us to journeys or to bedrooms. And those are the most valuable companies. And the industrial era companies are not dying, but they're having to adapt fundamentally because the most valuable companies don't actually provide hotel rooms. They don't own any hotels. They just connect people who have rooms with people who need to sleep. And this is interesting, because it means that the traditional industrial era companies, which includes all the banks and insurance companies, have to completely change their business model, just as these guys have had to change theirs and are changing theirs. And we've been immune to this change for so long, but it's finally happening. 20 years ago, people were saying that Microsoft would become a bank, that Virgin and Walmart would take over banking. They don't. They haven't. Because we still need banks to do banking. But we need different banks, smaller, leaner, digital banks with less physical structures. And that's the fundamental shift. It does amaze me on this chart that in five years, because this was in 2016, Stripe had gone from nothing to a company valued 22 times more than JP Morgan by employees' numbers. Today, it's valued about 60 times more than JP Morgan Chase for employees' numbers. And the reason is that they do something incredibly simple with seven lines of code through an application program interface, or as was referred to by an earlier speaker, APIs. I call them APIs, but it's only because I like acronyms. Um, and that's how they built their business. 
seven lines of code to become 60 times more valuable than JP Morgan Chase in seven years. And this is because we're going through a digital revolution. And the traditional structure of banking is based on physicality of buildings and humans in branches. And we're saying that's the model that's changing. And it needs to change because we need to digitalize and move across to the right-hand side of this chart. There's a lot of smaller players that are also very physically structured and focused. And some of the challenge banks that we're seeing now are starting fully digital, but the ones that were challenging, like the Virgins and Walmarts 20 years ago, were very physical. They copied what banks do. And they're trying to move across the scale. And all these new fintech companies and all these new digital companies are starting right there, fully digital from day one. But they have no history, they have no trust, they have no customers, they have very little money, although the money is flowing. This year in Latin America, $600 million has been invested in technology startup companies, over a billion last year, just in Latin American countries. So this is somewhere that's growing fast. They have access to money, but they don't have access to customers. And then we have these big internet giants that worry everyone, because they are huge. And these are the guys which typically we talk about as Google and Amazon and Facebook, but I talk about them as also Tencent and Alibaba. And these are the guys who really are changing the world, not just of commerce and relationships, but of money and trade. And it's something I'll come back to throughout the presentation. But let's begin by looking at banking. Banking in most countries, and the biggest banks in most countries, were established two or 300 years ago. You know, Santander, BBVA, the Spanish banks have been around for quite a while. And Lloyd's, for example, a few years ago celebrated their 250th birthday in Britain. And the business focus at the time of launching banking was to enable cross-border trade to support the Industrial Revolution, which is why these checks from the 19th century have trains on them. And we put checks in the post, and that was a real innovation, one of the massive innovations of trade in an industrial era, we could do trade with paper that could be trusted because the bank is licensed by the government. And that's the reason why often the banks are the oldest institutions in a country, because they created the economy of that country working with the government as a regulated, licensed entity to issue and store value. But this is slow and expensive. The only people who send me checks these days are Americans. And typically it takes, if it's more than $10,000, 28 days to get the money into my account because my bank won't put it into my account until they get it in their account through the SWIFT network. And they charge me $200 for that sort of transaction. It's really not fair in the age of transacting Bitcoin on a Sunday morning worth millions in seconds, well, actually more like 30 minutes, but even so, that's far better than 28 days and $200. We need something that's much faster and much cheaper. And that's what digitalization is doing to everything, making everything real time, accessible now, and cheap. And this is the challenge of how to deal with real time and cheap. Because when you think about a bank's business model, your, or any company's business model, it's pretty much the same. It's a back office that manufactures the products and the services. It's a middle office that does the infrastructure and the transactions, connecting the back office and the front office. And the front office is all about having good relationships with customers through high staff relationships, investments. And so really, it's about products in the back office, people in the middle office, in the front office, and process in the middle office. And the bank system was built on that structure of physicality in the Industrial Revolution, where all the processes, all the people, all the products were generated and owned and just distributed by the bank through buildings and humans in branches. And everything was controlled by the bank in buildings and humans in branches. And that's what's being destroyed by the technology digital revolution. Because now everything is open source, open banking, partnering and co-creating and collaborating with companies that do parts of our business that we used to always do ourselves. And this open partnering, co-creating, collaborative culture is a real change for any bank that controlled everything in the past. Because we have to convert from being a control freak to being a collaborator. That's tough. 
And most of digital is not about technology. It's about leadership and culture. And that's what a lot of the banks that I've dealt with are most challenged by because they don't have leaders who have technology in their DNA, in their blood. They have bankers leading the banks. I'm not saying you get rid of all the bankers, but you need to be digital bank. Half of that is digital. Is the leadership team digital? That's the big challenge. And when we think about the products and the processes and the people, it's now changing because we're doing relationships that tip, historically would be done face to face, which is why we have that physicality. The distribution of paper in a localized network focused on buildings and humans. And yet now we're moving to this platform structure and experiences and the digital distribution of data in a globalized network focused on software and servers. It's a radical shift, and I think it's a shift that starts with a clean sheet of paper from the ground up, and then see how aligned your digital vision of your financial company is to your industrial era physical structures. And do you need to keep them? Do you need to launch a new bank, a separate brand? Can you evolve the old bank to be a digital bank? Have you got the right people to do that change? It's a cultural change. It's a leadership challenge. It is not about the technology. When we think about these connections of people who need something and people who have something, like I need a ride to connect me with someone who has a car. Well, Uber and Lyft and Grab and so many platforms provide that service now, which is why they're valued so highly. I can get an Uber from this uh, conference within two minutes. I checked just before standing up here. So Uber works here, and it works almost everywhere, except where they've banned it. The same with Airbnb. You, know, you can find a much better room or place to stay if you want to, far cheaper than staying in a hotel. And I know this because we're going to D Dubai for our winter holiday, and I can stay for a month in Dubai in an Airbnb for the cost of 10 days in a hotel. The first time I met anybody in fintech was on March the 30th, 2005, 13 years ago. And the reason why I say this is that before that, I think most of what we had was technology and finance. And this guy didn't use the word fintech, but he talked about a business idea, of a platform for money. And I'd never heard this idea before. And his idea was that people want to buy things and need money, could connect to people who have money. <laughs> and they could borrow off those people through an algorithm, through software and servers, on a platform as a peer-to-peer -peer lending system called Zopa, which is a UK peer-to-peer -peer lender that's now massive. It's got about, um, between Zopa and its similar companies in the UK, about 10% of the UK new personal loans marketplace is through peer-to-peer -peer lending. In the USA in 2010, most lending was done by banks. Only 1% was by non-banks. Today, 35% of personal lending in the USA is from non-banks. And the challenge this really creates is that if you have buildings and humans, and you're competing with software and servers, the basis point margin collapses with algorithms because they've automated the risk, the risk modeling. So Zopa runs a $3 billion loan book with around 100 staff. And that's the difference. Much less people, much more software, much lower cost. How do you compete with that model? <coughs> Excuse me. I look at it as the apps, APIs, and analytics revolution. And the apps are the front office experiences, the APIs are the middle office processing, and the analytics is the back office. <clears throat> and it goes much deeper than this. Let's start by looking at the apps. Because we talked a lot about mobile social over the years. And the best way to illustrate this is the virality of the network. Because when someone sends you money, and it says on the app, you've got money, what are you going to do? Go download the app. And that's exactly how some of the largest wallets have appeared around the world. One of the biggest being created by these two guys. This is uh, Ikmar and Andy. And they're two young millennials in America who, when 26 years old, had a weekend together. And Ikmar forgot his wallet. So what happened is that uh, throughout the weekend, Andy kept a tab on the amount of money that he was subsidizing for ICMAR. So every panini, every cappuccino, every martini was written down on a scrappy bit of paper. And at the end of the weekend, 
Andy said to Igmar, okay, you owe me $183.46. And Igmar said, oh, I'll put a check in the post when I get home tomorrow. Being 26 years old, they said, this is pretty stupid. So what they actually did is, in the weekend, because they could code, they developed an idea of sending money through a social app uh, via PayPal as the back office processor, and they called it Venmo. And you may have heard of Venmo. It's one of the largest social payment systems in the world, processing about $40 billion last year, because PayPal have invested heavily in making this a really good social app, so much so that it's now a verb. I just Venmoed you. But it's because when someone sends you some, in, uh, it, uh, some money, and, and it says it's in Venmo, you just down, download the app. Why wouldn't you? So the experience of that front office is radically changing through digital devices. And it's not just the connectivity of apps, it's also the connectivity of things. I recently saw that we're talking today about the internet of ears, these things. And you may wonder what that means. Well, it's Siri and Alex, Alexa. Yeah, they're listening to us, so we now have an internet of ears. I saw a presentation just the other day where someone said, Alexa, find me a loan for $9,000. And Alexa comes back and said, I found five options. I recommend Amazon's. <laughs> and that's because it's so easy now to connect the apps through APIs to find any information you need and create amazing user experiences. In fact, when we talk about platforms like Uber and Airbnb and Facebook and Google, all they are is a group of APIs. You know, Uber wouldn't exist if it didn't get APIs from Google Maps and Stripe's APIs for payments. That's all it is, a collection of APIs creating platforms for connecting people who have something with people who need something. There are loads of APIs in banking and insurance that are appearing every day. My favorite, I've already mentioned, is Stripe. Because these guys, John and Patrick Collinson, when they came up with the idea of Stripe, were teenagers. Teenagers, because they can code, are reinventing banking and finance. Because they can code. Kids understand code. That's creating the future of our industry. And that's why we have to engage with kids who can code, because they can create multi-billion dollar companies with just a small amount of code, as long as it makes it easy to connect those who have something with those who need something through platforms. And then the back office becomes interesting, because the back office in my lifetime has hardly changed at all. I still deal with an awful lot of banks that have 20 or 30 year old back office systems, or even older, COBOL, develop systems, and I'm not saying they're bad, I'm just saying they can't deal with today's challenges. The back office is changing because we talked a decade ago about the impact that cloud and big data would have on the bank itself. And now we talk a lot about machine learning and artificial intelligence. And in fact, these two technologies, artificial intelligence and distributed ledger technologies, are gonna be the most transformational parts of back office systems over the next five to 10 years. And I don't believe that a bank with 20, 30 or older core systems in the back office can deal with artificial intelligence because it's dumb systems. It's systems that don't understand the customer. They don't have the insights to provide customer intelligence. So most of the time when we talk about artificial intelligence, we talk about the fear of robots and the fear of layoffs. And there will be some, but I think there will be lots of new jobs created. Equally, we talk about artificial intelligence as though it's already here. It's not even started. Artificial intelligence is a machine doing one thing really well. Artificial general intelligence is where a machine can do several things really well. So the machine can play Go, it can play um, Jeopardy, it can play chess. It can do multiple intelligent things, not just one intelligent thing. And super intelligence is when the machines become more intelligent than us, which people predict will be about 15 years away which actually will lead to better lives for us, because we can learn things that machines cannot learn, as Andrew referred to, like empathy, sympathy, ambivalence. In financial services, most of the current investment in artificial intelligence is going into automating risk, automating compliance. Because when you have one in three people checking what the other two people are doing, if you can automate that, that makes sense. And there's a lot of banks investing in automating compliance. For example, in JP Morgan, they now have a machine that can analyze their wholesale commercial contracts 
in one second that historically would have taken 360,000 hours of legal time. So yes, we can sack all the lawyers. Maybe that's a good thing. In UBS, they have an artificial intelligence machine that can take an instruction from a high net worth client and execute that instruction within one second. Historically, it would averagely take 45 minutes of a wealth manager to do that. That's now automated. One area that's incredibly complex is best execution, which if you're familiar with the investment markets, you'll know how complex that is. But in the European Markets and Financial Instruments Directive, it was defined as four different things. So the client could ask for the lowest cost to process a trade, faster speed, the best price, or the highest likelihood of the trade instruction being settled, as, as, as in actually achieve the executed trade. For human to manage those four dimensions of trade is incredibly difficult. But JP Morgan, again, has automated this through artificial intelligence. And interestingly, in 2010, they were not a big investment bank in the USA. Today, they're in the top three and regularly outperforming the other two because of this intelligence. And talking of trading and investing in markets, you know, Goldman Sachs talk about how their traders have disappeared. There used to be 600 guys here, and now there's just me. You know, when you look at UBS's trading floor in New York, this is in 2005, and it's not very visible there, it's more visible here. Lots of guys at trading desks doing execution of trade instructions from high net worth clients and investment institutions, and now there's no one there. That's gone. So yes, we will automate the things that machines can learn, but the machines can't learn everything. And in particular, I think the challenge for most banks is right now, do we have a holistic view of the customer across all the dimensions of their data as a single view of the customer, or do we have fragmented, silo, product-focused views of customers? And I would claim that most of the core systems of banks have old, structured views of customers. They don't have a holistic view of the customer. For example, this is my bank statement, um, and what it's showing me is what actually is just a basic branch ledger system, because that's what it was when it was first implemented on an IBM mainframe in the 1960s, and it's still pretty much running the same way. It tells me what I've bought. It doesn't tell me what I can afford to buy in the future. In fact, my statement today looks more like this, which is that I just use other platforms and apps and experiences that give me far better knowledge of my life and my financial lifestyle. For example, there's a bank that's launched in the UK called Loot by a 21-year-old dropout from university. Kids are creating the future. Why did he drop out of university to launch a bank? Could you even, when you're at university, imagine dropping out to launch a bank? The reason he's dropped out of university to launch a bank is that he just had this old statement from the bank in the app that didn't tell him that whether he could go out and party this weekend, could he afford to go on holiday in June, could he afford to buy the books that he needs for his course. So he wanted lots of predictive forecasting, and the bank's apps across the UK don't provide that, because they're just old transactional apps. So the experienced economy is moving the back office through customer demands to be far more intelligent about customers, to know the customer in depth across their lifestyle in a single view that's holistic, not fragmented across many old systems. The blockchain and distributed ledger technology is too difficult to talk about in this keynote. Uh, I think the easiest way to summarize it is that distributed ledger technology, or blockchain, brings together everything that we don't understand about money with everything that we don't understand about technology. It's kind of the hard thing to really get your head around. Just when I thought I got my head around blockchain, someone said, well, it's not blockchain, Chris, it's distributed ledger technology. I said, well, what's the difference? He said, well, distributed ledger can be created without a blockchain, which is what R3 and Corda have done, for example. Uh, but equally, Bitcoin never mentioned blockchain, not once in the original Satoshi Nakamoto paper. It talked about peer-to-peer -peer ex intermediary exchanges without intermediaries. But what it did have is this idea of sharing a database that could be Un uncorruptible, it's tamper-proof, that's what it solved. The ability to do transactions, record them in a public domain on the Bitcoin blockchain, and have that as a trusted record. And it's this trusted record of truth 
that got, has got everyone excited about this technology. Because if we can create a trusted record of truth on the network where everyone has a copy of the trusted record of truth, and whenever it changes, we all see the change of that trusted record of truth, then we can start to create interesting things. One of the most interesting right now that I see is a lot of banks developing trusted records of truth using blockchain distributed ledger technologies based on Ethereum in many cases for their corporate networks. Because in the supply chain, you can get rid of all that paperwork that goes with receivables, payables, letters of credit, bills of lading, you know, all that overhead of reconciliations and exceptions management of paperwork can disappear when you have a trusted record of truth that's automated through distributed ledger technology between your corporate customers and the bank. There's lots of other areas where this is developing. And it's taking a lot longer than people expect, because when you're creating a trusted record of truth like a digital identity scheme, you're not going to get that overnight. That's going to take years, because it's not the technology. It's all about creating the model of trust between governments, financial intermediaries, and banks, and corporations and citizens. And that's far more complicated than just launching a technology. But I did hear in Finland, I just came from Finland, that they now have uh, a lot of their government systems moving to distributed ledger technology, going live in 2019. Dubai is going live with the whole of their government structures on distributed ledger technology by 2020. China's developed many of the most innovative blockchain projects, but you don't hear about them much because they come from China. And in finance, we can see lots of areas where this will have benefit over time, particularly if you have it controlled within an institution like the Australian Stock Exchange launching a distributed ledger for clearing a settlement, like NASDAQ has. But creating a replacement for SWIFT, that'll take a lot longer. Creating a distributed ledger technology for Visa and MasterCard, that'll take a lot longer. The reason a lot more institutions involved. And the one area where I am seeing most activities around clearing and settlement, because there's an estimate that we can save $20 billion a year in inefficiency in the clearing and settlement space by using distrib distributed ledger technology. What interests me here is that most clearing is done by central counterparties with central banks, with central custodians. How do you decentralize central institutions in a clearing and settlement structure? That's a good question, but I don't have time to go through it all now. I did say China's got most of the interesting use cases. And I recently went to a meeting with uh, Alibaba, Alipay, in Hangzhou, China. And they've got more patents for distributed ledger projects than any other co company in the world. So there's huge things of interest happening across the China space and across other spaces. And most of the financial companies are looking at either at Hyper Hyperledger, which is the IBM distributed ledger system, or Ethereum, which is by Microsoft. And Microsoft, working with many banks, has launched this enterprise Ethereum Alliance to develop these technologies for all of us to work with and get these benefits. The reason why that interests me is that the guy who created Ethereum was 19 years old, Vitalik Buterin, when he launched the first papers and ideas around the Ethereum blockchain. Teenagers are inventing the future of finance and business because they can code. It's a message I keep coming back to because I think it's an important message that kids are creating the next generation of finance because they can code. And that's where so many of these startups come from. So many of them using code to create new ideas across front, middle, back office of finance, across all lines of business of finance. And I guess our challenge is how do we work with these people because they're teenagers, they're millennials, they're people who are nothing like banks. In fact, when I talk about fintech, I see it as the joining of two different pieces. And for a bank, it's a big challenge because collaborating with people who want to change the system and disrupt is very difficult when you want to keep the system stable and resilient and robust. So it needs a change of thinking in, in the banks. And some banks are changing their thinking, like Goldman Sachs. You know, on this chart, I'm not sure if you can see it on the middle of the right-hand side, one in four jobs that Goldman Sachs advertised for in Q4 2018 had the word engineer in the title, the job title. Yeah, that's not something that we've seen before, but that's what banks are doing. They're hiring coders. When I go to somewhere like BBVA, I see that they have what I would call a cannibalization process taking place. 
There's a cannibalization externally where they scout and partner and invest in third-party companies that are doing interesting things to come and work with them or to merge with them. But there's also an internal cannibalization process to say if we can destroy stupid things that are paper-based with automation that machines can automate, let's do it. Otherwise, someone else will do it to us. And DBS, for example, in Singapore, it's an interesting company because it's a state-owned bank that in 2009 started a digital transformation journey and now have the digital customers twice as profitable as their traditional customers because the digital customer does the work for themselves rather than having to work, deliver the work to them. They describe themselves as a 24,000 employee startup. And that's the mentality that the CEO is trying to get into the heads of all the staff, that we're a startup company focused on innovation and customer centricity. How do you get that through the people is a cultural change program. And Piyush and his team in DBS have done a massive digital cultural change program. Not the technology. They've done that as part of the program, but it wasn't the technology that drives the change. It's the leadership. And I think for a bank, you know, the future of the bank is three major roles. Right now, we talk about asset management, and we think about asset management as physical goods and products and services, but there's a big role for digital asset management. And I don't see financial institutions focusing on this enough. But we will need banks in the future, because banks are secure vaults of money, but they should be the secure vaults of privacy. You know, I don't want Mark Zuckerberg knowing everything. I want to have someone I can trust storing my data. You know, if I lost all my Facebook account tomorrow, I wouldn't be that bothered because I've got all my photos backed up on Google Photos. But if Google Photos lost all my photos, what do I do? F from their perspective, I I'm not paying for it. It's, fr it's free. You know, but I would rather put it in a secure vault, just as I would like to put my contracts, my digital contracts, in a secure vault. I'd like to put my digital intellectual capital into a secure vault. I'd like to store my digital draft of my next book in a secure data vault. And there's a role for that, which I think the banks can deliver to customers. And then ask the customer, how much do you want to pay for this vault? You know, if you think this is worth $2 million, it's going to cost you $2,000 a year to have a secure vault. But there's a role for that. There's another role which is interesting. The Royal Bank of Canada's CEO came out with this one the other day and said that the focus of Royal Bank of Canada is to create an integrated experience for the customers through APIs of their life events, like having their first home, having their first relationship, having their first child, having their first loss of job, becoming unemployed. These events are how the bank's envisioning their value to the customer, because it's the big life events where you have the most uncertainty and need the most support. A great example was from Nordea, a bank in the Nordic region, who were talking about an event like a car accident and saying that through their apps and APIs, they'll bring all this together so that the car can actually deal with the trauma of the accident. The car can order the tow truck. The car can tell the insurance company it's had a crash. The car can tell the garage what's gone wrong. The car can order you a taxi to get you home. And we'll do all that automatically if it crashes through the bank's integrated apps and APIs with the insurance inf industry. So the bank of the future has three main roles. It's a digital and physical asset management company. It's a life events manager and it's a curator of all of these technologies. Because I don't have time to go out to a thousand technology companies and test them out and see if they work. You know, all these companies that are doing great ideas about unbundling the bank, I don't know who they are, I don't know if I can trust them, I don't know if they're regulated. Why should I go and find them all? You find them. And that's exactly what the companies that get digital in banking are doing. So JP Morgan, instead of having the bank unbundled, is rebundling the fintech. They're partnering with a number of companies to give customers choice. I just saw Deutsche Bank's doing this the other day, where Deutsche Bank offer you deposit accounts with other banks because they want to provide a choice of service for you, but still keep the relationship with you, give you the experience, the experience economy. And the experience economy just changes from this control freak into this collaborative partnering institution. And it's a big cultural change to make that happen, particularly when the people you're partnering with are typically kids, because kids can code. 
Now, kids want to disrupt and change the world, but you as the parent want to keep everything secure and resilient the way it was and the way it is. Don't let the child destroy everything. In fact, the best example I can think of this is that the chief uh, uh, digital officer of Nordia Bank was presenting their fintech partner, Spiff, at a conference I was at recently. And Ewan, who's the chief digital officer, said, so here's Carl Nikolai, the CEO and founder of Spiff. Welcome, Carl Nikolai, to the stage. And Carl Nikolai's first line was, my three-year-old likes to play with dinosaurs, so do we. Hugely not respectful of their bank partner, I thought. But I can see where he's coming from, because most of the bank's boardrooms I walk into, I'm greeted by a group like this, a bunch of old men. <laughs> you know, how are they going to transform the bank to be digital, to work with fintech youth, when they don't have any youth in the boardroom? They don't have any females or m many other people in the boardroom, except for that, these guys, who have grown up in banking. They're all bankers. You know, you know, the risk, compliance, audit, all that stuff, we understand that really well. But tell me the difference between distributed ledger technology and blockchain, Mr. CEO. Difficult. Does anyone who reports to the CEO know? Well, no, because the guy who does DLT, he's under the CIO who reports to the CFO. So it's all hidden. We've done digital because we've got a CDO. In fact, we've got six CDOs, one in each line of business, chief digital officers. We haven't done digital. We've just delegated it. And yet digital is the future of the bank. So the biggest challenge is to get pe people at the leadership team who understand digital and technology to lead the bank through this massively revolutionary change process. And often to get rid of the legacy leadership, which is just hard because the leadership doesn't want to get rid of themselves. That's a big challenge. So banks are becoming like technology companies. And uh, I feel you put a slide up earlier today with ING Ralph Hammer's saying that they're just a technology company with a license to be a bank. Um, I hear that a lot. I, I don't agree with it because I don't think that's what banks are. I don't think banks are technology companies. I think banks are banks. And we see a lot about big tech firms are now behaving like banks. Well, they are because they can. So Amazon has loads of financial activities, but they're not getting into these financial activities to be a bank. They're getting into it to create more commerce on their platform. And that's a criticality of the big internet companies. That they're not in it for banking, for finance, for loans. They're in it to leverage their platform, to get more business on their platform, to get more trust from their customers, to buy more on their platform. This is what it's all about. That's the reason why Amazon is one of the biggest lenders in the USA, but it doesn't make any money on loans. It gives them away, because it wants more merchants to get more business on their platform. PayPal gives loans in the USA. One of the biggest lenders in the USA is PayPal. And their loans don't cost anything in terms of there's no f interest on loans. They're free, except for the setup charge. But there's another key point here, in that when I look at America and Europe, and that's where I spend a lot of my time, I think they're legacy com countries, legacy economies, because a lot of their infrastructure was implemented before Mark Zuckerberg was born, and it's still the same infrastructure. And yet, when I look at China and Alibaba and Alipay, and what's going on, particularly in China, because it has such scale with 1.2 billion citizens, the same with India, then you see the next generation of finance developing. A good example is I launched Digital Human, and Digital Human has a 100,000, sorry, a 20,000 word case study on, Ali, on Alipay. And the reason why I focused on Alipay is that they're the only company in the world that has actually implemented a financial inc inclusion program on a global basis, which I can spend time talking about afterwards. But Li Wang, who headed up Alipay Europe, joined the panel of me and Ashok Razwani, the CEO of Barclays Bank. And in the middle of her discussions, she said something which made Ashok almost faint. <laughs> it's certainly his, his, his ma mouth dropped. Because she said, the average Alibaba employee generates $16 million of revenue a year the average employee. And the reason why Ashok looked a bit upset is that the average Barclays Bank employee generates about $400,000 of revenue a year. This is the chasm between fin and tech in action. And when you hear the Alibaba and Alipay story, you can see that China's leapfrogged America. So America, in 2017, did about $150 billion of mobile phone payments in total. China did 15 trillion. 
and it's estimated 45 trillion by 2020. 45 trillion US dollars through mobile phones. If you go to China, you can't use a card to pay for anything. I've tried, and a lot of shops won't take credit cards or debit cards because they don't have plastic. They just have mobile apps. And many of them don't even accept cash anymore. So if you're a tourist, it's a big challenge. And another reason why I picked on Alipay's a, a case study is Eric Jing at the World Economic Forum two years ago, near enough, said two billion users will be using their services by 2025. Bear in mind, this is a company in China with 1.2 billion people. Where are the other 800 million coming from? Well, they're coming from outside China, obviously. And talking to Ant Financial was a revelation because, by way of example, they are on their fourth generation systems architecture, which means they've regenerated their back office from scratch four times. This is a 15-year-old company, which means that every three or four years, they completely rethink their back office from scratch. And the reason is that they started as just a pure escrow service in version number one. But now they are a complete service with integrated risk and fraud management through artificial intelligence on every transaction, processing 125,000 transactions per second average. You know, Visa globally processes, on average, 2,000 transactions a second. These guys are processing 125,000 a second. On Singles Day, which is the day that they made up to get business on their platform, they processed $25 billion in one day. They processed over a billion transactions that day. At one point, they were processing 256,000 transactions a second. It's phenomenal scale, and every single transaction has fraud and risk analytics built in. This is thinking way outside the box with technology because they started with the internet and they started with the vision of building a new way of thinking. In fact, what they're really doing now is rolling out their technologies through apps, APIs and analytics to many third parties around the world like EasyPezza in Pakistan, Ascent Money in Thailand, the Mint and Globe Cash Gcash in Philippines and Indonesia. And in fact, the one that I like the most here is Paytm, because Paytm is run by Vijay Shakashama, who is a 39-year-old Indian who 10 years ago was homeless. He'd been bankrupted by his friends. They're not his friends anymore. <laughs> and he actually says that he had to decide between walking to a job interview and having lunch afterwards, or having uh, a, a, a ride on a bus, or even more unlikely, a taxi, because he couldn't afford it, uh, and not eating, just 10 years ago. But now he's the youngest billionaire in India. And what he did, and this is what I mean by digital includes everyone and gives everyone opportunity, is he went to Jack Ma at an Alibaba conference in 2011 and said, I want to bring Alibaba and Alipay to India and partner with you. And Jack Ma believed in the young guy so much, he invested in him. And now they have 300 million banked Indians who were unbanked before, rising with a vision to 500 million fully banked Indians by 2020. They're one of the fastest growing payments companies in India. And all the technologies in their back office are coming from Alipay, from China, just as they are with Ascent and with EasyPezza and with others. Which is why if you valued Ant Financial as a financial company, it would be the 10th largest financial institution on earth, valued at $150 billion last month. But they're not a financial institution. They're a technology company that does finance. And what's interesting about them is they really think differently. I thought I'd just show you something that they're doing, which kind of blew me away when I first saw it.
脸之父。You kind of get the idea <laughs> that they are definitely a technology company, and what they're doing is they're exporting all of their technology capabilities around the world. So all their apps, APIs, analytics are available to anyone in this room if you want to work with Alipay's technologies. And that's the strategy that's taken them to over 2 billion people by 2025. In fact, I think they might get even more than that. Tencent is doing the same. Badu, which is China's Google equivalent, is doing the same. They're all technology leaders. This is、um, Yang Sun at the meeting I was at on Friday in Helsinki in Finland talking about Alibaba. And what's interesting is Alibaba Group has lots of different pieces, and I didn't get a copy of the slide, but you can see at the top he's talking about the ecosystems of different areas, like entertainment, where they make movies, and Ali Tours that takes people on tours and visits to, around the world, to their platforms, and their platforms include Ant Financial, which is for financial、uh, processing using technology as a technology company. But the one below Ant Financial on this chart is a group called Ali Mama. Which does their data management and data storage, and Yang makes the joke, but I use it now all the time. Which is Ali Mama is called Mama because she looks after Baba, because she has all the money and has all the assets, and that's what data is, as far as Ali Baba is concerned. Ali Mama has all the data, and therefore she, that's why she's called Mama. I did wonder where Ali Papa was. I was guessing Ali Papa would be Ant Financial because they have all the money. And then he put up this chart, which is the traditional banking architecture, and said, "So now we offer this, which is their banking architecture." And this is the reason why I say this could go anywhere around the world. A good example is people think Alipay is for Chinese tourists, and yet in Europe there's a company working on a local version with Alipay technologies to give anyone in Europe a mobile wallet that works across the whole of Europe in local language. But the technology behind it will be Alipay. So you kind of get the idea that this innovation is coming not from America. The innovative thinking, the really tr tr amazing thinking, is coming out of Latin America, Africa, China, India, Philippines, Indonesia, the Southern Hemisphere, where a lot of the people didn't have the infrastructure and architectures implemented to do what they can do today, and they've developed these in infrastructures and architectures in the last 10, 15 years, like Alipay. But, and that's my final but. I'm almost in conclusion here. There's one big thing about this: we're a technology company that happens to have a banking license, or we're a technology company moving into banking. And the biggest difference between the two, and this is the reason why we still need banks, is that the technology companies don't really get what we do. They're very naive. Your banks actually have millions of customers, centuries of history, and we know why we do a lot of the stupid things we do. It's for a reason, as in it keeps the company, the economy, society stable and secure. These kids come in and they have no history, no trust, no customers, and they challenge us. But they soon learn that the reason why we do some dumb things is because the regulator forces us to do some dumb things, like reserve lots of capital for Bar Three. There's a reason for that. And the tech giants think they can come into banking and take a lot of our services, and, and they can. They, they will definitely take some of the low-hanging fruit. They will take our credit cards, our credit lines of business, our loans lines of business, maybe some of our savings. But they won't become full-service banks because a lot of these kids, as I say, are very naive in the startups. But a lot of the technology companies、um, are. Doing things very differently. You know, we often talk about Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple. I talk about Fatback, which is Facebook, Apple, sorry, Facebook, Amazon, Tencent, Alibaba, Badu, and Google. And these are the big giants who are trying to get into banking. But the biggest difference between them and us is they're not regulated. You know, that's the reason why, when Andrew was talking about、uh, European. Chase down on the big internet giants. It's for a reason, which is that because they're not regulated, they get away with murder near enough. Fake news, rigging search results. You know, and if anything, I find that Alibaba is far more trustworthy than perhaps the, the Amazons or Facebooks of this world, because the Chinese internet giants are actually far more accountable to China's government than the U.S. ones. I discovered the other day the reason why. 
the technology companies are so unregulated in America. This is from Bank of America Merrill Lynch, which shows the average financial institution deals with 128,000 regulation. The average technology company deals with 27,000. So we deal with five times more regulations than technology companies. And the reason why the technology companies get away with it is because Bill, Bill Gates, for those of you who may remember this, 20 years ago, was hauled up in front of Congress. And they actually had a um, investigation about Microsoft's practices. And the conclusion was that Microsoft needed to be bro broken up into five companies. It didn't happen, but that was what could have happened. And as a result, Bill Gates has said to Jeff Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg, you need to lobby. And so they, they invest millions in lobbyists in Washington. So the reason why these big American technology giants have no regulation and get away with all sorts of things. But if they want to get into banking, they'd have to deal with five times more regulation. And they don't want to do that. So they'll never become banks. They'll just try and do a lot of things that banks do today, cheaper and faster and easier for the customer, where it makes sense. But they won't get into banking. Well, that's my view anyway. I could talk a lot longer, and I haven't even talked about Latin America or Africa in any depth. But one of the key things when I come to Chile, Brazil, Colombia, Argentina, is that I'm seeing the rise of fintech here happening very fast, particularly in the last couple of years. Um, the amount of fintech startups in the last year in Latin America has grown by 40%. And there's companies like Ubank here in Chile that are doing really interesting things. And I guess my challenge or question that I'll leave you with is how well do you know the fintech startup community across Latin America, not just in Chile, but across all the countries? Because certainly I see Cali, Mexico City, uh, San Paolo, you know, a lot of activity going on, a lot of connectivity between the financial institutions and the startups today. I see a lot of innovation happening, particularly in Mexico, because they are copying the open banking regulations of Europe, which means that banks have to open up and share data. And if you've heard about PSD2, the Payment Services Directive 2, and the fact that the banks are being forced to share data with third parties like Amazon and Alibaba, there is a converse PSD3 already under development that will force third parties like Amazon and Facebook and Alibaba to share their data with the banks. So what would you do if the big internet companies were forced to share data with you? What would you do with that data? How would it enhance your customer insight? How would it enable you to deliver better experiences? And how would it enable you to connect customers better between the money they have and the things that they want in life? And that's the question I'm going to leave you with. Thank you very much.